Okay, uh, today I want to continue uh, our study not by going further into the details of Derrida's text, but by pursuing this more concretely the idea of the exclusivity that's involved in the notion of universal inclusivity. And I want to do that in a more sort of concrete and empirical way by focusing on the specific idea of uh, universal human rights, which is a, an exemplary case of, of trying to define uh, a domain of universal inclusion. Uh, in Sites of Exposure, uh, in uh, Section 8b, I tried to set up why uh, we would want such a principle, which recognizes in a kind of absolute way the way each of us as individuals has a kind of entity that is beyond any specificity. Uh, and so, and so, and that's the thing that, uh, in recognizing the rights of the individual, it seems to me, uh, we are grasping about ourselves, right? As opposed to uh, focusing on ourselves as embedded in particular home environments. Um, and so, let, anyway, let me let me uh, give you a couple of descriptions of that. So, first, the the um, United Nations. Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In its preamble, it says something like um, recognition of the dignity and equality of all uh, human beings, all members of the human family or something like that, uh, is the foundation of human freedom or something to that effect. Um, and then the first article says, uh, all human beings are born free and equal with respect to dignity and rights. Uh, and they're endowed with uh, reason and conscience and should live together in a spirit of brotherhood. I mean, that's a pretty good statement of the idea of universal human rights. Um, and uh, so I wanted to talk about that idea uh, and that idea as a kind of um, principle of our modern world, which means our modern democratic world. Uh, and this, that sense of our will become a little clearer in a moment. Um, I wanted to, to talk about that first by, by trying to bring out uh, the in, in, what I would imagine would be your intuitive grasp of the sense of that. So, you know, if you've never taken it up theoretically before, in a way it shouldn't matter because it's just so much a part of everyday discourse and the everyday attitudes of our culture that I think you should say, oh yeah, I know that. Um, and so the notion of universal rights is, is the idea that uh, every you know every person has something about them as a person that makes them you know worthy of dignity and respect and so on and you know worthy of being able to choose things for themselves and so on and um, without that uh, uh, with, without the recognition of that there's something kind of oppressive uh, happening uh, and so we 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 invoke that pretty powerfully and this will go directly back to that theme Derrida was making about democracy and its other, and you know, Islam and as the other of democracy in a particular way. This comes up commonly when when we um, think, oh, uh, we. It seems to us that in Muslim cultures, uh, women, the rights of women are not respected, and so we we from our side criticize that culture on the basis of this notion of the universal rights which recognizes the sort of what we th think to be the sort of inalienable right of the individual to you know a certain kind of self-determination and we see women in that culture and others uh, uh, at being uh, inadequately and unfairly recognized or treated um, so a, a few things so I'm, I'm taking I'm taking that to be a pretty familiar, point of view so I'm hoping you can immediately recognize that and in that point of view it seems to me you can recognize a number of things you can recognize the notion of universal human rights and in a sense it's intuitive appeal uh, and by intuitive appeal what I mean there is I take it that anybody any of us who live in this modern culture can immediately say oh yeah I know what's being talked about there I recognize it uh, I rec and I recognize the point um, but also the idea that um, uh, there's a kind of missionary character to that notion of rights. So, you know, last time when I was talking about Derrida's chapter three, I was bringing out this, uh, you know, I made this remark that, you know, you can't just have democracy bound within 
the limits of a nation or of a country, right? That the very idea of, of democracy is going to have to be that if it's going to include everybody, it's going to have to be something that matters beyond your boundaries too. And you can see that here in this idea that if we really recognize the rights of the individual, that's not just something about Canada or it's not just something about the United States or wherever we happen to live. Like we have to care about the fact that people over there are not having their rights respected. And so the recognition of that notion is inseparable from the imperative to uh, respond to situations in which uh, other people's the, the rights of other people are not being respected. Uh, so that's the second point. So first I want to say we should just be able to recognize that notion of rights and its appeal. Second, we should be able to notice this missionary sort of character and, and this idea that it inherently transcends boundaries. And the third point I wanted to make is it just underlines that point Derrida was making about the other of democracy as Islam and so on. Um, that that um, the kind of way we participate in this democratic world of universal human rights um, brings with it a recognition of the opposition to certain kinds of cultures that that are not recognizing that thing, and 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 certain um, Islamic states are, are exemplary of that in the contemporary political picture. Um, uh, and again, let me let me just underline the thing that Derrida says. You know, this is the thing I'm saying is not a claim about the inherent nature of Islam or anything else. I'm trying to talk about very particular contemporary historical realities um, that I take it, you know, are fact. I take these to be factual matters that are well documented that we, we can investigate, right? Uh, anyway, so so I wanted to point to that example as a place where you see this principle in action in the way that it, if you believe in this principle, if you're a Democrat, you have to care about the way the rights of Muslim women are not being respected in certain contexts. Uh, a second place where it seems to me we, again, encounter this in an extremely familiar way, and that, that again, exemplifies kind of all these points, or a, a similar set, I shouldn't say it exemplifies all these points, but it exemplifies a set of important points, is in our uh, very familiar views about the enslavement of black people in America for hundreds of years, right? So, again, we think, uh, uh, rightly, that people shouldn't have been enslaved, right? We think um, there's something wrong with taking these people and enslaving them because they are human. They were human beings. They're all dead now. But, uh, they were human beings, and and as human beings, each one of them has the same kinds of rights, but essentially rights to self-determination, to think for themselves, all those, all those things, same, have their dignity respected, and so on. And enslaving those people was, was a fundamental mistreatment of them. Uh, and, and, um, and, and so, we, therefore, we see the liberation of the black slaves in America the Amer through the American Civil War as a as a victory for freedom, a victory for democracy, a victory for rights. Right, we side with the North against the South. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a pretty prominent issue now with you know people wanting to take down statues of Southern generals and so on. Right, it's the the the, the recognition. It's the recognition of rights that makes us condemn those practices and continue to condemn now practices that don't condemn them right like we're uh, so you don't want to see somebody putting up a celebration of a general from the confederate army um because it, it seems like oh that's actually a statement against the recognition of the rights of black people which is a statement against the recognition of the human rights in general and so on um and so there again also that we side with the north against the south and and there again you can see that kind of missionary thing right that that the north was right to fight the South, uh, uh, at least in part, for the purpose of liberating the black slaves from from slavery and so on. Um, so I want to point to that example as a, a as a the the Muslim example is is a is a contemporary point where we say, oh, there's a problem. And again, I keep using this we um, to mean 
it's integral to the experience of all of us who experience ourselves as belonging to this particular culture, this democratic Western culture and so on. That's a contemporary example. The, the Muslim women example is a contemporary example of a place where we recognize a wrong and we think it's incumbent upon us to try to change it. And, and then we have a past example where we say it, it, there was a wrong and it was incumbent upon us to recognize that. And we're glad that we did, you know, and we, we celebrate the victors in that context. Um, so I wanted to point to those first as, as, as I said, what I take to be sort of, they should be fairly intuitively, immediately clear examples of this kind of thing I'm talking about. And, and presumably you can um, identify with the value in each case. Um, so, so that's the first thing I want to do is just to bring out the idea. So now I want to uh, talk a little bit more about... Uh, a little bit about history. Um, uh, I, I, so I said what I want to do is look at that issue of human rights, and what I want to do is try to show how that, as you know, um, exemplification of this notion of universal inclusion, has a problem in it. it. Has a problem in it both in principle and in fact. So I think I will save the problem in principle till a little bit later. I want to talk first about why it seems to me there is a problem in fact with that as a version of universal inclusivity. And this is basically what the ch chapter 8C, or lesson 8C in Sites of Exposure is about. So I'm more or less going through the core material of that. Um, so that notion of universal human rights uh, is uh, pretty definitively associated with the culture of the West, because that's the culture in, in which it was really born. Right? And so the, the from between roughly, let's say, 1400 and 1800, uh, the modern world was sort of being brought into being um, through the activities of the European West, through activities that are in significant way rooted in this this principle of the rights of the individual. In at least three ways, there's a there's a revolution in the world that's taking place in or in that time, and it's a economically it's a revo the, the capitalist revolution. With respect to knowledge, it's the scientific revolution. And then with respect to politics, it's a democratic revolution. Uh, and so, you know, capitalism uh, is an approach to economics that's built around the rights of the individual, the rights of the individual to participate sort of without external encumbrance in economic activity uh, in contrast to state intervention, church intervention, church church subsidy, state state subsidy, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to go through the discussion of capitalism in detail. Uh, I mean, you can see what I say in sites of exposure. That's not in detail either. It's a few pages, but it's but it's uh, you know, it would give you what you need. Obviously, if you wanted to study it in detail, you'd have to study Adam Smith or Karl Marx or uh, someone like that. But I'm just going to talk about that as more or less the contemporary economic situation world we live in, which is really built around the, uh, the freedom of individuals to own things, especially own, you know, machines and technology and so on, um, to build, build enterprises individually, and uh, for individuals to hire themselves out as labor and so on. Um, that world really emerged out of Europe uh, over a few centuries, but especially in, you know, let's say, starting around 1400 and so on. So that's a, that's an economics of individualism. At the same time, or shortly after that, I guess, uh, maybe around late 1500s or 1600, um, we start talking about the scientific revolution, uh, which is, again, uh, an approach to knowledge that is um, rooted in the capacities of the individual cognizing mind to know the truth. Right, so it's 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 a approach to knowledge, the one that we all rely on po powerfully. Whenever you want to take uh, drugs to cure a disease, or fly in an airplane, or, or have cold air in your refrigerator, like we we totally depend on the knowledge, the approach to knowledge that came out of the scientific revolution. When you're looking at the computer screen and the videos, um, and, and the idea there was that it's the human mind, precisely that that sort of um, rationality that was named in the Article One of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
uh, that um, grants us access to the truths of nature and so and knowledge then has to be something that speaks equally to the mind of any investigator and that's sort of the idea behind the experimental method um, I could say more about that too I'm not going to do it here but that would be another thing to, to look at um, but so so those you know so let's say starting in 1400 you have a capitalist revolution in economics that that revolves around the notion of the enterprising individual uh, 1600 you have the revolution in knowledge the scientific revolution that revolves around the individual knowing mind and then in the late 1700s you have these revolutions the american revolution and the french revolution that um, try to install uh, that recognition of the individual in in political in in political life the the establishment of democratic government the french revolution uh in 1789 it started in 1789 uh, you know, had its uh, declaration of the rights of man and citizen. And Article 1 of that, I think, I to, yeah, is uh, men are born free and equal in rights. And social distinction may be founded only upon the general good. Uh, but, you know, there again, you have, you know, that the idea of that revolution is that men are born free and equal in rights. So, you know, this notion I've been talking about, about universal rights, like that's what, that that's the name of the principle of the French Revolution, trying to, get rid of the monarchy and establish democracy. Uh, the American Revolution, similarly, the Declaration of Independence, um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Um, same same point again, right? So, um, uh, created equal with certain inalienable rights. There you see that notion of, of, of individual rights that I'm saying is sort of implicit in the capitalist revolution and the scientific revolution there you see that notion explicitly being announced as uh, the principle that's being endorsed and it's going to be the foundation of political life and it's going to be the foundation of democracies so uh, so I want to say if you want to see what that principle is in fact it's that it is the West it's that culture that the the thing we call Western culture European culture a, a modern European culture is the culture built around that idea of the rights of the individual um, and so you know you we announce this idea as a as a as a sort of abstract principle that the rights of people have to be respected the point i'm trying to make here is that 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 notion has some specific culture some specific cultural forms attached to it but if you're going to take that idea seriously it's going to lead you uh, on the face of it, to be a capitalist, uh, to it, it's going to lead you to be uh, somebody who endorses the early modern ideals of science and so on. It's going to lead you to be a Democrat. So you know we're ta talking about you know wanting to um, free Muslim women, liberate liberate Muslim women from oppressive situations. Well, capitalism is like that too, right? You want to liberate people from oppressive economic regimes and allow them to participate and, and say you know. You, there's something oppressive going on here if, if you're not allowing free enterprise. Um, something oppressive going on here if you're not allowing the development of science in the sense that we use that word in our culture um, uh, as, as modes of knowing. Right? And so, so, you know, and I talked before about the, the, the sort of missionary idea behind human rights or int intrinsic to the notion of human rights. And that means there is a kind of imperative to spread capitalism. There's an imperative to spread modern science. Uh, and so that very notion of human rights translates into more than even a justification, a, a requirement that the culture of human rights, which is the culture of capitalism and science, as that's launched in early modern Europe, there's an imperative that that culture be spread, and so the, you know, the the Europe of of um, the 14, 15, 1600s, um, late 1400s anyway, um, starting then, uh, that culture was a imperial culture, a colonizing culture, right? The British, the French, well, initially the, the Portuguese and the Spanish, then the British, the French, the Dutch, you know, they moved out from Europe to uh, Asia, Africa, the Americas, and brought with them their European culture 
on the one hand, I think kind of obviously exploiting the places they went to, but in another sense, uh, in light of this principle we're talking about, kind of civilizing those places, right? In other, in other words, what they brought to those places was their Western modernity, where that modernity was built around the institutions that are built upon the recognition of the rights of the individual. And so in a way, they were bringing individualism to those cultures. And so they, it, their intervention in those cultures was wildly transformative, highly destructive in all kinds of ways, um, uh, obvious ways, famines in India and so on. But it, even ignoring those things, it's just wildly transformative just because it's the, the um, radical transformation of the, of the way that culture was functioning. Uh, not just for reasons of exploitation, right? The, the, or what I mean by that is there is a kind of justification for a lot of those actions in that sort of missionary notion in, that, that is integral to those institutions and those practices. A really uh, excellent presentation of this is um, Genoa Achebe's novel, Things Fall Apart. It's a great novel, uh, and it's about... Um, the arrival of European colonists uh, in uh, modern, modern, what would be modern day Nigeria, um, and it's it sort of portrays the uh, encounter of two different cultures. And if you are a person from this modern culture, the kind of person who who thinks it was right to free the black slaves in America, and we don't want uh, women to be oppressed in Muslim cultures. Um, if you are a person who has those views, it's be hard to read Achebe's novel and look at the coming together of these two cultures and not in pretty significant ways want to side with the European colonists and think, oh yeah, there's some things those people are doing there that we'd want to, we want to stop. And so the, the point I want to make there is that there's a real way in which you don't understand European imperialism if you don't see uh, its intrinsic connection with the, the norms, the demands intrinsic to that notion of the recognition of the rights of individuals. And consequently, if you endorse the recognition of the rights of individuals, you, you don't have that easy a route into criticizing a lot of those practices. Um, and so, uh, well, there may be lots you can still criticize, but it's not, it's a more complicated issue than, than you might often imagine. The point then that I want to make there is that that recognition of the rights of individuals is, is an endorsement of a certain kind of culture against another kind of culture. And so you can't really endorse that value without saying, our culture that recognizes those values is going to and should take over and redefine your culture. Um, that you could say that in a way that sounds bad, but maybe it's not bad. Maybe that is in fact right. Um, uh, the, we um, how could a concern for human rights not be a matter of criticism? How could it not be? a sort, right? A reason for saying, I have a reason for thinking what you're doing is wrong and it's incumbent upon me to fight that. Um, but so this is, this is just a way of bringing us back to this idea that democracy is supposed to be one regime among many. That is to say, we're choosing dem democracy against other alternatives, right? So de democracy should be exclusionary. We don't want Nazis, right? We don't want absolute monarchs. We, we want democracy, right? Democracy should be exclusive and critical. Right? Um, but, the, but then the funny thing is that, that that sits oddly with our idea of universal inclusivity, whether from the point of view of universal rights or the other one. So, um, but, but then let's stick with that notion of universal rights for a second. I'm going to say one more thing about it, but that, which I'm then going to put off, but I want to say it. You know, the recognition of universal human rights is is the, the idea that individuals have to be recognized for the, you know, internal dignity and respect they have as beings who who have that life beyond in the sense that Heidegger said. That's that's our 
real rich exploration of that. But, you know, in common parlance, it means we're rational. Uh, or, or as they say in the um, Article 1 of the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we're beings endowed with conscience. Um, um, and so that means it's not you in your particularity that we're celebrating. Oh, you happen to be six feet tall. You happen to be a worshiper of um, uh, the, uh, Shiva. Uh, you um, you like chocolate. Like th Those aren't the things about you that we're saying we have to protect. We're going to protect you insofar as you're the kind of being who can have a conscience. Uh, and that's really what we're defending. We're defending the right of people to live by their conscience, and we consider people to be oppressed when they can't do that. Uh, but it's not you in your particularity that's being protected, and that's why we can be critical of the particular way you're living, even as we are defending your character as a as a individual, right? And that's why we can simultaneously be critical of you know what we perceive to be these oppressive aspects of Muslim culture, and still say we're actually working on behalf of. Muslims when we oppose those practices. Right? But anyway, so as I said, I wanted to just name that that notion of the difference between ourselves as uh, beings capable of conscience and that idea of the particularities of how we live, to, uh, which I said I will come back to. At this point, just to, to help make clear why this principle gives you a ground for distinguishing uh, that in the person that you're protecting and that which you would be opposing. Put it, put it that way. Um, anyway, um, so what I wanted to do in the, the second point I was trying to make, right, right? The first point was just trying to intuitively introduce it. The second point was trying to talk about the historical specificity and so on. I wanted to, to associate this with a culture and the culture of the, uh, well, the, the European West and really the Christian West. Um, uh, that's where come. That's what those Western cultures were historically, you know, and and indeed, as I try to show in sites of exposure, these ideas are really the ideas that come out of Paul's letters, which is to say, the founding text of Christianity, um, uh, uh, really, which is related to some points Derrida makes in the first paragraphs of that chapter. But I'm not going to explore them right now. But yeah, I've been trying. I've been trying to show how how this notion is related to that culture of the Christian West, um, and and indeed to show that it's not. It's not, it's not easily separable from a kind of practice of, well, what you might think of as cultural imperialism. Well, that's, des that's describing in a kind of a negative way. In a positive way, you might talk about it as a sort of missionary spreading of the recognition of the rights of, of man. And I, don't think, I don't think you're going to find anything in there that's going to justify enslaving uh, Africans, obviously. But, but you, but I guess what I'm getting at is you can see how those, those things that happen are part of the story of what was happening in that European culture, which can't be separated from the fact that the story of that culture is the story of this recognition of, the, of these principles of indiv individuality, of individualism. Um, and so, uh, going back to a point Derrida made before about um, the democratic and the demographic, like, in a way, at, at some level, you know, the Democrats are the Christian West, and those are the capitalists, and those are the people who belong to this culture uh, that, in many ways, built itself on the riches of... Um, international exploitation that were it's in, that were empowered by the practices of colonial expansion that in that in some significant way are justified by the principle of the missionary principle of individual rights um, so really you know I'm not going to go pursue that in greater detail really what I'm trying to do though is just get you to see that you don't want to just conflate all those things and think they're all the same but you also want to see that you that you can't easily separate them as a kind of historical reality. They're part of the, they're part of the same thing, 
And especially at the level of a culture, you, you surely can't really separate contemporary Western culture from all of those parts of, it, of its history, right? Where, where this culture is now is in a significant way built upon all of those things. And so, you know, going back to this, this issue of democracy and its other again, and, you know, the West and Islam, or to the extent that democracy, that the values of democracy can look like the values of the West as opposed to the values of Islam, um, you can see that the thing now that's that's getting the badge for being democracy is a culture that in its contemporary existent reality, as I say, can't, can't really be separated from all those other historical things that are integral to defining what it is, how it has got here, and what it is now. And so... Um, uh, and again, that that might start to underline some of the that idea that I spoke about before. That maybe maybe there's something desirable about the other of democracy, N not necessarily because you want to oppose democracy as, su as such, though you might want to, but maybe because you want to oppose the West. And to the extent that democracy and the West uh, are identified. Um, maybe the thing that opposes the West and the thing that opposes democracy, in a sense, have to be the same thing. But it, it makes the, the reality of that thing much more ambivalent, much, much harder to nail down in, in a simple interpretation that says, oh, that's a culture that uh, fails to respect the rights of women and therefore we have to oppose it. Right. Um, anyway, so let, but let me just carry on. Uh, so, so as I said, the second point was really just trying to bring out this um non just not non non accidental uh, identification of this principle of universal rights with the reality of christian european western modern culture um and now uh so a, a second Okay, actually, so, so, okay, so that's what I want to do. I wanted to intuitively introduce the idea. I wanted to sort of historically introduce the idea. And now I want to talk about uh, problems in that notion of human rights from two sides, from the sort of factual side and the side of principle. Um, from, the, from the factual side, I, I'm going to just make one point. Well, actually, no, I'll, I'll make two. I'll, I'll say one quickly, but then I'll focus on, on the other one. The one I'll make quickly is that... Um, there might be good reasons to criticize capitalism and um, the science that, as it emerged out of the early modern period that we live by today. There might be reason to criticize those, um, you know, on economic grounds and on knowledge grounds, epistemological grounds. You know, not just because you don't happen to like them, but there, but there, there may be problems internal to those things. Um, uh, indeed, I think there there are. You know, and so Marx is, you know, the great analyst of capitalist capitalism, who you know showed that the to the extent that it's justified by a certain kind of uh, principle of uh, individualism and so on and certain kind of liberation, uh, it runs afoul of itself since the thing it naturally produces is the opposite of that. It produces a kind of a exploitative monopoly where individuals are kind of uh, left left behind and can become only indifferent wage labor. Um, and individuals can't compete against, um, against heavily capitalized industries. As I said, I won't pursue that analysis, but but you know Marx's point is that capitalism is is in a way kind of internally contradictory, uh, that it that it looks like one thing to begin with, but through its own history, it shows itself to be something other than you might have expected, and and brings up has a lot of problems attached to it. So that would be one aspect of a, a, a kind of empirical criticism of what building your life around building your economic life around the insistence on the rights of the individual is going to do. Uh, similarly with knowledge, uh, again, again, this will be very quick, but the scientific revolution is, is sort of uh, the early modern one that we call the scientific revolution is, is built around a certain view of what knowledge is and a certain view of what nature is. Uh, mostly it's the idea that we're going to, uh, that you know nature not when you recognize it in the form in which it presents itself, but when you can get past the way it presents itself and can find and harness the powers operative in nature that have produced the forms it presents itself in, but that you can harness to do other things with. So it's really nature 
it's a, it's a kind of it's a kind of instru- it's an inherently instrumental view of knowledge in the sense that it's a pursuit it's a study of nature for from the point of view of learning essentially how to control it um, and we might look at the we we in, are living with a lot of the consequences of that right we might look at the world right now with uh, lots of environmental problems and you know other things uh, as you know the world of modern technologic technology and all, all the things that that has brought in its wake. We might look at that as um, empirical evidence of the problem of this. Of course, it's brought other things we like in, but air, airplanes. But you can't really have airplanes and refrigerators, which are reflections of that policy, without all kinds of pollution, without the destruction of the rainforest, you know, without all kinds of other things. So there again, you might see that there is. Uh, there is much contemporary empirical evidence of the problem of the kind of approach to knowledge that's built around the authoritative, the exclusive authoritative stance of the cognizing intellect, some, something like that. Um, I won't pursue it. Um, but the the other, the, the third um, empirical one I wanted to point to is, is just a particular, particular point about liberation. And it goes back to that issue of uh, liberating the um, black slaves in America. Um, w- one of the things about that is you, you say, well, you know, we're going to free these people. We're going to, you know, and they're not going to be slaves anymore. Um, those people, so, so you say, okay, you're now free. And now you say you have free and equal rights the same as everybody else does. Um, and you have a principle of rights that says everybody's the same. We don't care about their particular situation. Well, suddenly uh, those people can say we're those black people can say we're in a really bad situation. Uh, we have nothing. You know, we've we've uh, here I am, a, an adult man, let's say, who's now officially free. But I have spent my whole adult life being a slave for somebody. And so, I got, you know, I'm at the age of whatever, 35. I got nothing. Um, I, got, I don't have much education. I don't have any accumulated wealth. I don't have any land. I don't you know, I don't have any independent skills beyond the you know, the kinds of things a laborer can do. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, the response of the culture is, yeah, it's too bad. You know, we don't, uh, everybody's equal. We don't, you know, give special treatment to people who happen to have lived their life in a way that they're now poor. You know, uh, so, you know, the, the, the notion of the equality of people, the universal equality that pays no heed to your particularities means that principle justifies or maybe even requires that you not give any political weight, any political recognition to the particular circumstances of those people who were oppressed. And so the, the principle of rights, you know, you free those people, but, but it also immediately absolves you. It absolves the state. It absolves consciences of individuals whatever you like it, it involves every it absolves everyone of responsibility for doing anything to address all the evils that have com- been committed that produced this awful situation for this person um, on the grounds that if we paid attention to that we would be um, validating the rights of your particularity but our political principle is the opposite. We validate rights that precisely disregard particularity. Uh, so, so one of the empirical problems, and one of the big empirical problems then, is that the uh, invocation of the principle of rights putatively to liberate uh, oppressed people is a nice excuse for uh, absolving yourself of responsibility for ever addressing the horrible situation that was produced for them. Um, this is a pretty, pretty profound issue. For example, with respect to the you know liberated black slaves in America, it's, it's a very similar issue to those surrounding the indigenous peoples of North America, who you know were awfully exploited in the colonization of the United States, Canada, and so on, uh, and who now can say, look, look at this awful stuff that was done to us, uh, but but in the very principles that are used to justify caring about that are reasons for why it's hard to uh, find justification for doing anything about it. So I'll just name that. I'll just name that then as a, as a kind of a significant 
sort of empirical problem. So as I said, I'll just I'll name that. I'm not I'm not going to pursue it more deeply, though it is a very deep issue. But I hope that I hope that point is clear enough um, that the recognition of the identity of the person as beyond, going back to the language I was using in Sites of Exposure and connecting that to Heidegger's notion of sort of the unhomey character of Dasein, um, the recognition of our identities that way is built upon the non-recognition of our identities as people who uh, are embedded in particularity. And uh, so for all its liberatory potential, it also gives reason for not being able to um, address the developed problematic situ situations of oppressed people uh, in their specificity. Um, uh, let, so let me let me now carry on with that th theme now that I said I was going to come back to that theme in principle. Uh, so let me come back to that theme of particularity. You know, in Heidegger, we talked about the unhomey character of people, but we also talked about our inherent homey character. And that's a point similar to that I really tried to bring out in, in um, Sites of Exposure, that yes, we have an identity beyond, but that goes hand in hand with the fact that we also have to have made ourselves at home in the world. And that, that experience of being at home is is non-removable from from ourselves and from our sense of identity. And that means there is no one who is just, you know, in the language of um, the UN's declaration, who is just a rational individual. Um, there is no one who is just beyond specificity, right? There, so sh surely it's, it's true. Like, so let me read you a line from um, page 96 where I was talking about individual rights, right? Um, at its core, this conception of the person as a bearer of individual rights is essentially liberative of the person. It recognizes a definitive aspect of persons such that, without that recognition, any situation of human practice is necessarily oppressive. Right? That's from page 96. Um, yeah, there's something fundamentally right about the principle of human rights because it's recognizing what we have demonstrated phenomenologically to be an integral dimension of our existence as Dasein, as experiencing beings. But we've also demonstrated it to be an integral dimension of our existence as Dasein, as experiencing beings, that we have to make a home for ourselves in the world. And that means each one of us uh, has something that is our own and in a way can't be shared. Right? To be a being, to be a Dasein, to be a, a person, you have to have made a kind of home. And that means a place where... Uh, you live in something that is defined as defined as mine or ours that is a border against what is outside that has excluded something and it can't be shared with someone else and so in that sense it's relative to you and it's not something that's absolutely uh, available to humans but it's absolute for you right it's something that for you can't be removed without removing who you are right and so it, it's absolute for persons that every one of us has has for ourselves something of absolute importance that cannot be shared with anybody else. And, and so the the notion of human rights, uh, as, as it's been articulated in those things I was reading, can't, can't acknowledge that. And it's, that's really brought out in that French declaration. Men are born free and equal in rights. Social distinctions may be founded only upon the general good. Right? I mean, you, you really can't... Um, hand out goods differently or make any kind of distinction that's going to be recognized as um it's going to be sort of publicly and officially recognized as 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 a uh, proper and appropriate unless it is reflective of the general good right so so that very principle as they articulated in the in the french declaration seems to me to capture well this idea that this notion the, the way people are being recognized is all coming from the perspective of universal inclusion and therefore, in principle, it can't recognize things that are that are exclusionary, like our homes, right? like the like the things that we need to have for ourselves. So it seems to me that's what's wrong with the notion of universal human rights in principle, rather than just in fact. Right? I was trying to bring out in the in that uh, my third point um, about the problems of capitalism, destruction of the environment, uh, the inability to um, 
address the problems of exploited peoples. Um, I was trying to bring out through those examples the, some of the kind of um, empirical or factual failings of the principle of human rights. Um, uh, here and now I'm trying to bring out something about that problem in principle, that it's a, it's a one-sided recognition of the person, that it, it only recognizes us in, recognizes us in, so f in terms of universal inclusivity. It doesn't recognize the need for an exclusivity for non-universalizable dimensions of our experience. Going back to the UN, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, Article 25, insists on a right for social security, and they say, um, they talk about the economic, social, and cultural rights that are indispensable for dignity and the free development of personality. And again, I think, yeah, it's a gr great that you say that, but it seems to me the conception of rights articulated there in Article 25 basically conflicts with the conception of rights that's articulated in Article One in the way that I'm talking about, right? If you if you really are going to say there is a right to um, the economic resources, the social resources, and so on that that allow you to develop as a person, you're going to have to say you're going to have to be committed to people doing things that that really can't be shared. You're you're basically what you're saying is there's a right to establishing a home, but establishing a home means establishing a particular way of doing things. That not everybody can participate in, right? And so, and that notion of home, right? You know, now go back to what we, what we looked at in more detail through these chapters of sites of exposure in particular. You know, home, remember, was something that operated at every level, from becoming at home in your body when you walk, to riding on the bicycle, to becoming at home with another person, to becoming at home in a family, to becoming at home in a culture, and so on. So when you think about what it and and the notion of human rights came from trying to transcend all of that. Right? So as soon as you bring in the notion of home, you're endorsing all those things that you were otherwise saying we were going to transcend. And so, you know, that means there is a right, for example, to to live in the kind of culture of, um, you know, the theocratic Muslim culture. Uh, you know, in other words, you, you people, uh, people are at home in those kinds of cultures and there are ways of being at home, like the way we are at home in a family. Um, brings with it non-universalizable ways that we establish rules with respect to each other, rules for behavior, and all the rest. Um, and so, you know, going back now to that that example of the you know freeing Muslim women from oppressive cultures, you know that's a, that's that kind of missionary orientation built on the notion of universal human rights really. Um, fails to ask what what is the internal structure of that world that people are living in right and uh, so you can look at something that from the point of view of your culture looks like the way a woman is being mistreated and her rights aren't being respected and it may that may there, there may be a lot of truth in that but but the terms of your approach you were never for you, for you to make that judgment. The terms of your approach were, were, approach were never required to go through an interpretation and understanding of the terms in which her world functions. And indeed, even to single out her is already to have presumed the individualism that's that's built into that Western conception. Uh, whereas. The point about being at home is is, is that um, we're actually not unambiguously individuals, right? The, the part of the whole point about being with, from from Heidegger and so on, and that I, I especially tried to bring out in sites of exposure and talking about home and being at home with others and so on, is that our our, our very sense of ourselves can't be separated from, from the way we get into relationships of mutual evaluation and and belonging with other people, and therefore. Um, to simply talk about the rights of individuals is already to have made this massive, let's say, cultural move of denying the place of the family, denying the place of the culture as kind of rights bearing human units. And so that goes back to Derrida's point about, you know, having to decide how you're going to count. And, and, you know, I tried to draw this out a little bit already. You know, I said, should we count? individuals should we count families should we count in ward should we you know whatever well so, you know the, the question is what what is the relevant unit of human life is it the individual or is it the couple or is it the family um the these um 
seems to me there isn't an unambiguous answer to that. That doesn't mean there's nothing to say about it. That doesn't mean there aren't right and wrong ways to talk about it. But there isn't an unambiguous answer to it, uh, it's, uh, I think, um, based on the sort of phenomenological points we've been making. I think that's, I think I want to leave it. Oh, no, I actually I have one more uh, actually kind of important thing I want to say. But, but I'm going to leave my discussion there of the basic notion of universal human rights and that, that the, the way that's integrated in democracy uh, uh, and how through our discussion of that as a kind of empirical historical reality, especially as I explore that in that uh, Lesson 8C of Sites of Exposure, how that uh, brings out a kind of problem in principle and a problem in fact around that principle of universal human rights, which is highly reflective of the kinds of things it seems to me that Derrida is saying about democracy, uh, especially in that chapter three. Um, I want to make one more point, and it's, I should have said it earlier. When I was talking about the um, the ways in which the culture of the West uh, has been, you know, the missionary culture, the culture that has the principle of human rights as its... Um, validation and vindication um, I was talking about how that is wrapped up with European colonialism and also the problems of the problem of addressing the problems of European colonialism uh, I had actually wanted to talk about Fanon there and so I'll just mention it here I won't go into it in detail um, but Fanon's essay The Lived Experience of the Black Man is a great uh, description of how um, the very culture of rights and scientific knowledge and so on uh, is what he uh, uh, lives, him, lives, lives himself as excluded from. So it's a great story about that, a great account of that. And, and so it's sort of an account of um, a kind of racism that is built into that uh, what is in fact historically the culture of human rights the capitalist scientific revolutionist democratic uh, world of human rights and so on um, so i'm going to come back and talk about fennel a little bit uh, again but i just want to mention it here that i wanted to put him in there uh, both uh, his essay the lived experience of the black man is is good for talking about the kind of oppressive side of that culture and then the essay uh, on uh, concerning violence, the first chapter of the book, The Wretched of the Earth, is good, f especially for this other point about how the principle of human rights um, easily absolves the colonizing nation from dealing with any of the problems that, that history of colonialism has brought about for the colonized people and how the, li the freeing or the liberating of slaves or colonies is essentially a way of absolving the responsibility the responsible power of responsibility for the problems that it's caused. So as I said, I'll just mention that there. I also have uh, four other short lectures on YouTube on Fennel on these issues, and uh, I'll, um, I'll put a link up here, um, but I recommend you, you look at those. Okay, so I'll, I'll leave it there for now.